Welcome everyone to this IES webinar, Making Sense of Environmental Problems Using Systems Thinking Approaches. This webinar will look at some basic concepts underlying systems thinking, and then as a case study, draw on the environmental problems currently being seen in the River Wye. As always, there will be a chance for questions at the end of, all of, uh, at the end of this presentation, so please do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen, and you can do this at any point during the presentation, and I will then ask these on your behalf later on. I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker today, Brian Hopkins. Brian has worked internationally in the learning and development field since the late 1970s, originally in education and then in consultancy with private sector and international government organisations. Since 2000, his work has primarily been with United Nations agencies and NGOs in humanitarian, development and environmentally related projects. In recent years, he has specialised in examining the role of the learning and development profession in furthering the process of strengthening social and economic sustainability practice in organisational activities. Thank you so much for joining us today, Brian, and over to you. Right. Thank you, Ethne. Right. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar where I, I hope to show you how basic systems thinking ideas can help you to make sense of environmental problems that you're involved with. Before we begin, let me introduce myself. I've worked most of my life as what I call a learning and development consultant, which means that I design, deliver and evaluate programs to help people learn about specific subjects. During the last 20 years, almost all of my work has been with international organizations, uh, such as the United Nations and NGOs on learning about subjects in the humanitarian development and envir environmental arenas. I'm not an expert at any of these subjects, my expertise lies in being able to talk to experts, unpack complexities, and present them to people who need to learn the subject. So as I talk to you today, I'm not an environmental sciences expert. I'm just an ordinary person trying to make sense of what seems to be a complex problem. What are we going to look at in this webinar? Firstly, I'll look briefly at what we mean by a system and the basic principles of systems thinking. Then I'll look at how we use these principles by examining a case study about a subject that some of you may know something about, where we will draw some different sorts of systems thinking diagrams. Finally, I'll, I'll summarize why I think diagramming is a very useful way of trying to make sense of complex problems, such as the ones we're often looking at in the environmental sciences world. Over the years, I've found that making sense of complex problems is made much easier by using some basic systems thinking ideas. So what do I mean by systems thinking? Well, well, a system may be seen as being a collection of interacting parts, which creates some output affecting an external environment. In the world of systems thinking, we can distinguish between two basic types of system. A hard system, is something composed, composed of physical objects which interact to produce a specific output, like a bicycle, which is a collection of mechanical parts which creates a system for transportation. Similarly, when you order something on the internet, you instruct a hard system which sends data through to various computers and machines, which ends up pushing a box onto a conveyor belt. The behaviour of a hard system is essentially deterministic and predictable. In contrast, systems with human entities are soft systems, and the behaviour of a soft system is generally not deterministic or very predictable. In reality, most of the world that we experience is comprised of a mixture of hard and soft systems. So, for example, when the hard system of internet ordering meets the soft system of a delivery driver, we can find that our precious package is delivered not by handing to it to us on the doorstep, by, but by it being hidden in a hedge outside our door or put in one of our recycling bins. Another important point is that while hard systems physically exist and are very visible, a soft system may not be visible at all. That means that to think about how a soft system is behaving, we need to imagine it to be a system, to imagine it to be a system, I stress. In systems thinking, we call it a conceptual construct. This is a very powerful idea because we can start to make sense about how an environmental problem is occurring by looking at it as the output of a system that we can conceive of. This will start to make more sense when I move on to look at a specific instance of what I conceive of as an environmental problem. 
So first, I want to talk about three important principles underlying systems thinking. These are that a system has interrelationships between parts, that there are multiple perspectives about what is happening in a system, and that we always make boundary judgments about what the system is. Firstly, interrelationships between parts. In any system, different parts of the system connect to and influence or are influenced by other parts of the system. The delivery driver's behavior is influenced by the software which dictates their delivery times and the route that they take. It will also be influenced by their own physical and emotional state on any particular day. There are always multiple perspectives about how a system operates and all of these are valid. All individuals have their own way of understanding how the world around them is working. We sometimes call this a worldview. The online retailer will have one perspective, the delivery company another, the driver another, and the customer another. If we talk to each of these about how the system works, they will all have different ideas about what is or is not working well. Thirdly, we have to think about boundary judgments. These are decisions about what is or is not part of a system. Probably the delivery driver would see the system as being bounded by their warehouse and the instructions on their mobile device. On the other hand, a customer might see the system as including the retailer's promise that the goods will be delivered within 24 hours. Where we draw the boundaries of a system has a profound effect on how well we understand the overall behavior of the system. Note that these principles are closely connected and influence each other. Our perspectives will inform inter interrelationships we see, and this will have an impact on boundary judgments we make. No boundary judgment is absolutely correct. What is important to understand is why we make the judgment that we do. So let's now move on to look at a case study and I'll show you how we can bring in these ideas of conceptual construct, interrelationships, multiple perspectives and boundary judgments into a real life environmental problem. We'll take a look at the ongoing problem of pollution in the River Wye, something which has been much discussed in the media, and in particular the Guardian. Spoiler alert, I am a Guardian reader. Now, apart from a brief family weekend spent a few months ago near Hay on Wye, I know very little about the river other than what I've read. But reading text is not an easy way of making sense about a situation, as invariably it provides a lot of detail structured in a linear way which makes it hard to identify the different actors and their interrelationships. <coughs> Excuse me. So to try and understand what is happening on the why, I've used some systems thinking diagrams. So let's see how. Firstly, what is generally best to put together is a rich picture. A rich picture is a simple representation of who is involved in a situation and what connections they have with other actors. This will start to give us an idea about the interrelationships and boundaries that we need to consider. I personally like to draw my rich pictures on paper, on a flip chart, on a whiteboard, so that it's easy to make changes and start again. So here I am drawing a rich picture on a flip chart. I start off by drawing the banks of the river. Next, I put in what the problem to me seems to be, an algal bloom downstream. Then I add what seems to be causing the problem, chicken farming upstream. From my understanding of the situation, excrement from the chicken farms, which is high in phosphate, runs off from the farms themselves into the river, or it is collected and spread locally as fertilizer. And some of this then leaches off the land into the river. Whichever the route, the river Y starts to receive high loads of rich nutrients, which encourage the growth of algal blooms, which deoxygenate the river. I also need to think about why the chicken farms are there. They produce lots of eggs and chicken meat, which is collected by egg supplier companies and then sold to eggy customers in supermarkets and grocery shops. Now that is a simple linear system and I could draw my boundaries at this point. But as I read more about the situation, I realized that there are other actors. The farmers belong to the National Farmers Union, which represents their interests nationally. They'll almost certainly be promoting the economic interests of their members, but in theory, at least, 
should also be interested in making sure that what their members do is environmentally sustainable. So we will include them in the system to make sure that we investigate this point further. Then we also have something called the British Egg Industry Council, which is a trade body representing the companies who wholesale eggs to the supermarkets. Like the NFU, they will have an interest in encouraging egg production and sales. But what will their interest in environmental sustainability be? Now let us think about actors interested in the impact of egg production on the environment. We have the Environment Agency, the UK government body charged with responsibility for protecting the environment. They will, or should be, inspecting the river to see what is going on with regards to the pollution. Then we also have numerous groups of what we might call citizen scientists, concerned individuals who are doing their own sampling of river water and forming pressure groups campaigning against the local egg farming industry. Then we also have other formal bodies such as Natural Resources Wales, the Welsh government body introduced, interested in environmental protection on the Welsh side of the river, Natural England, its English counterpart, and River Action, a national campaign group looking to protect Britain's rivers from environmental degradation. Next, I'm interested in some of the tensions which might exist. The convention in rich pictures is to draw lines connecting conflicting parties, labelling these with a crossed swords symbol. From what I've read, there seem to be tensions between River Action and the farmers, and the NFU and Natural England. Although, of course, there may be others that I've not picked up on. Finally, something else which comes into our system is the UK government's interest in making sure that staple foods such as eggs and chicken are as cheap as possible. So that represents my rich picture of the River Wye chicken farming system. Please note it's my own perspective based on my own limited understanding of the situation. So I'm not saying that this is complete or accurate. Ideally, what I would be doing is constructing this rich picture with other people, each of us drawing in actors and connections that are relevant according to our own individual worldviews. In fact, the process of doing this is in many ways more valuable than the final rich picture, as it stimulates conversations about what is important, who is included or not included, what the complexities of interrelationships are, and so on. So let's just think about what the rich picture means in terms of our three basic principles. It shows us the interrelationship between entities and helps us to identify our own particular perspective on the situation. Drawing a rich picture will incorporate, with other people, will incorporate everybody else's perspective as well. Note that what you include or leave out of the rich picture reflects your own boundary judgment. For example, it would be easy to overlook the British Egg Industry Council or the National Farmers Union, but doing so might mean that we fail to consider an important part of the River Wye situation. <coughs> Excuse me. A rich picture can do a very good job of identifying the different actors or entities that are involved in a situation, and it's useful next to work out which ones of them are part of the system of interest. To do that, we can draw a system map. I find that the best way to do this is to start out with a pad of small post-its and a large sheet of paper or flip chart. And on each post-it, I write the name of one of the actors. When I have all the actors written out, then I move them around and group them into those which form part of the system and those which are in the system's environment. I can then draw a boundary defining which actors are in the system. So how do you decide which are in the environment and rather than in the system? That's not necessarily straightforward, but essentially we say that an actor is in the environment if they're affected by the system, but do not take part in what the system does. Sometimes this is obvious. For example, the river itself is affected by the chicken farming system, so is in the environment. However, what about the role of egg buying customers? They are certainly affected by what happens in the egg farming system, but do they influence it in any way? We would probably like them to be concerned about the implications of cheap eggs, but it is, is it realistic to expect them to play a part in that? For our purposes, this deliberation and thinking about who is inside or outside the boundary is very important. And there's not necessarily an absolutely right answer. What is important 
is to be able to justify your final decision. The next type of diagram we'll look at is called a multiple cause diagram. This adds a new dimension of understanding by looking specifically at the potential causes of a problem. I start by writing a brief description of the problem on my piece of paper or flip chart. Next, I ask the question, why is this happening? Well, one answer to this is because of the algal bloom, but why is that happening? This is because of excess phosphate in the river. And again, asking why? This is because there are many chicken farms in the area. We keep on asking why. So one reason for there being many chicken farms is the high demand for eggs. Why is this? Well, they're nutritious and cheap. And they're cheap because there is a demand for low cost food. Then we note that one reason why eggs are cheap is because there are many chicken farms. So we have a feedback loop. More chicken farms, cheaper eggs. We can come back to that later. But another reason why there are many chicken farms is because there seems to be no control over the number of chicken farms in the area. Is that true? I don't know. And it's something we would need to investigate further. One reason for it might be that, is a, that it is a good area for chicken farming. And that may be because there are, there's a lot of local expertise in chicken farming. Of course, we might see another feedback loop linking the number of farms with the availability of expertise. Let's go back to the amount of phosphate going into the river. Another reason for this is that the discharge of chicken excrement doesn't seem to be controlled accurately, adequately. Why is this? Maybe it's because control is too expensive or there are no other control methods available. But another reason for the excess phosphate may be inadequate monitoring by the Environment Agency. Why is that? Is this because of political pressures, inadequate government funding, or that there is a denial of the problem? Again, I'm not sure of the answer, and this is something that I would need to investigate further. So what do we have? We've got a diagram with a complex set of factors which are contributing to the ultimate deoxygenation of the River Wye. What this has shown is, <coughs> excuse me, is various potential causes for us to investigate in areas where we don't have enough under knowledge or understanding. What is important to note here are the multiple causes of the problem. Too often problem analyses identify what is called the root cause, a single reason why something is happening. In reality, most environmental problems are caused by a complicated mixture of multiple causes, and it's only by addressing all of these to whatever degree is possible that we can really hope to make any change. Once we've explored various dynamics driving what's going on in a system of interest, I think it's useful to go back to the system map and mark some of these drivers in. We can do this with what we call an influence diagram, like the one shown here. You can see that it's very similar to the system map we looked at just now, but what I've done here is to move the post-its around so that I can draw some connecting arrows. These arrows show the patterns of influence. What is important in an influence diagram is to get a sense of where the strongest influences are. So I've used three line thicknesses to show strong, medium, and some influence. We also need to look out for reciprocal influencing. And I draw this using reverse arrows. So in my interpretation, the big influences on chicken farms are from the egg suppliers who will be demanding cheap eggs and the environment agency who are monitoring discharges into the river. They in turn are influenced by the various other statutory bodies and pressure groups, but also come under strong influence from central government through things like limited funding and so on. Again, I'm not saying my analysis is complete or correct. There's a lot here I don't understand and need to research further. For example, somewhere I read an article which suggested that one of the supermarket chains had pressurized the Environment Agency to suppress a report critical of chicken farms that it was associated with. So I've drawn a line of influence connecting supermarkets with the agency. Ideally, I would investigate this further. So as with all the diagrams, what is important is the process as much as the product.
The last type of diagram we'll be looking, you'll look at, is sometimes called causal flow diagrams. They are, in fact, a specific tool used in one particular form of systems thinking called system dynamics. I think it's important to point out here that if you wander around the world of systems thinking and read materials coming from American sources, you may find they focus on system dynamics and tend to put across the idea that systems thinking is just about feedback systems like these. There are several reasons for this. Back in the 1990s, there was a popular American management textbook called The Fifth Discipline, which showed how system dynamics were useful in management theory. But of particular importance for the environmental world was the 1971 publication, The Limits to Growth, which many of you will know about. This used a system dynamics approach to show how such things as population, food production, raw material availability and pollution might change over the decades and could lead to a civilizational collapse by the middle of this century. Worth reading if you've not come across it. Okay, so drawing causal flow diagrams would be a webinar in its own right, but let us just briefly explain the key principles. Let's go back to how we might start to draw such a diagram. A causal flow diagram works by showing how varying levels of different activities interact with each other. By convention, we show that if increasing or decreasing one, in one variable increases or decreases another, we represent that by a plus sign symbol. But that if an increase causes a decrease, vice versa, then we use a minus sign symbol. By linking together changes in variables, we can create reinforcing loops which continue to increase or decrease, and balancing loops where the variables tend to cancel each out other but over time. <clears throat> Here, as the amount of phosphate released increases, there's an increased demand for monitoring, and the level of effective monitoring should go up, which in turn leads to increased controls on chicken waste. That would then mean that the amount of phosphate released goes down. But of course, that would mean that the demand for monitoring would then slacken, monitoring would decrease, and controls on chicken waste would also decrease. So phosphate release would increase again. <coughs> that means that we have a balancing loop where the amount of phosphate released fluctuates as time goes by. That sounds fairly likely, so maybe my assumptions are correct. But again, what we should be doing is having lots of discussions with other people as to what the nature of all these relationships are or should be. Let's add in another line of thinking. Increased phosphate release leads to more pressure from the environmental groups, which increases pressure on the government, and that should lead to an increase in effective monitoring. But working in the opposite direction, Increasing controls on chicken waste may well lead to lobbying from the egg industry, complaining about the level of controls, and that may result in government pressure being reduced. Finally, thinking about the economics of egg production, increasing controls on chicken waste will lead to higher costs, so the demand for eggs will decrease. The number of eggs produced will also decrease, leading to a decrease in the amount of waste and a consequent reduction of pressure for controls on chicken waste. That could then lead to fewer controls, and so phosphate release would start to increase again, and again we have a balancing loop. There's a lot of discussions to be had about whether or not these loops do represent reality, but this discussion is crucial. However, overall, I have a sense that the pattern that it predicts of controls and phosphate release fluctuating up and down as a system around the chicken farm changes seems quite plausible suggesting that strategies need to be ongoing and then there's not going to be any permanent fix. Maybe that's true. I, I don't know. I am not an expert. So we've looked at five different ways of programming, of diagramming, sorry. Each of them can bring out different perspectives on what is happening and generate new ways of making sense about a situation. I'm not saying that you always... <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, uh, you always need to use each different method or draw them in this particular order. But in my experience, drawing a rich picture is often a good starting point. With experience, you will learn which types of diagram give you the information you need in any particular situation. Diagramming is not necessarily a linear process where you go from one diagram to another as you finish each one. 
Working through the process of drawing one diagram usually creates into insights into something that's relevant to another diagram. So you can easily find yourself going backwards and forwards between different diagrams, adding and changing things. Don't expect diagrams to be 100% complete or accurate. There are always things to add or change. As the statistician George Box said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Remember also that the process of drawing is perhaps even more important than the end result. While you're drawing, you'll be thinking about what you know and do not know, what you understand and do not understand, who is involved or not involved, and so on. This process will be all the richer if you do it with other interested individuals who will all have different worldviews and different forms of understanding. Collaboration will give you a much richer understanding of any situation. What you should find is that by working through the process of drawing diagrams, particularly if you do it with other people who are also interested in the situation, is that you share different ideas, find out about things you do not know and need to investigate further and develop a more comprehensive understanding about the dynamics of what is happening. You should then be able to identify different actions you might want to take to make things better. As I said at the beginning, environmental problems are invariably the consequence of a complex mix of social and economic factors and decisions. And systems thinking helps us to recognize this and avoid pinning all our hopes on single strategies linked to our own individual area of expertise. So that brings me to the end of the presentation and we now have some time for you to ask questions. I'll do my best to answer any that you have, but if you'd like to follow up anything that I've talked about later, Here's my email address, and I'd be happy to try and help in any way that I can. Might I also suggest you take a look at my book, looking at organizational learning and sustainable organizations. This looks at what social and economic sustainability means for organizations, and it uses a systems thinking approach to help identify what internal learning may be needed and how this could be facilitated. The QR code here will take you to the publisher's website, and until September, that code LSS025 will give you a 25% discount. So that's enough of me talking. Over to you for questions. Thank you very much for being here today. Amazing. Thank you so much, Brian. It was really great to hear about um, those different kind of methods that you can use for systems thinking to th consider environmental problems. Um, and to all our attendees, please do put your questions for Brian um, in the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to kick straight off because we've already got a few in there. Um, so the first one is, when communicating with others who are unfamiliar with systems diagrams, which types of diagram do you think are the most useful to share in such contexts? And how can you best use the diagram to prompt input and inquiry on the part of other stakeholders? Well, the one that I found is most uh, useful to get the conversation started is the one which is the least formal. That's the rich picture. The um, the rich picture, you remember, is the one where I drew the river bank and I drew a, a very sort of uh, artistically accurate representation of a chicken um, and or you know, and just little symbols showing the different actors and the tensions involved. Um, <clears throat> often when I've been running workshops where I've used rich pictures, people sort of, you know, sort of flinch when I say, right, I want, I want you to draw some diagrams now, some pictures now, because, you know, many of us have very limited perceptions of our own artistic ability. But actually, rich pictures don't require any artistic ability, as my own sort of, you know, sort of naive art attempts should show to you. Um, I mean, I, I, I think of a workshop I did actually, which was on a very different subject on sort of personal security, uh, which I ran. And the, the rich picture I asked people to do was I said, OK, split up into small groups. And can you draw uh, a map of your city showing where are dangerous areas for women to uh, walk at night? And it was a it was a workshop related to gender and humanitarian action. So, uh, so it was mainly women involved in the workshop. and. Um, it was again the, the usual, oh my goodness, I've got to draw a picture. But actually, once people get together and they start, you know, somebody puts it in line and somebody puts you know, something else on. And as the collaborative, collaborative process starts, people really sort of get into the whole process. So I, I would always advocate starting with a rich picture. So whenever I'm starting a, a new 
a learning and development project, I'm trying to get my head around the subject, I usually start by just drawing a picture of who's involved, what's going on, because I know it helps me to kind of make sense of things. And in a group setting, it's actually much the much the least intimidating because the others are have got a sort of a formal quality about them. You know, the system maps, the influence diagrams, and in particular the causal flow diagrams are there's a certain complexity about them. And you need to have a, a bit of an understanding about some of the principles involved. But the rich picture is a great way to get people engaged in thinking about uh you know a, any sort of situation. So that's right. how I'd answer that question. Thank you, Brian. Um, and then a little bit more of a specific question here, but it's just um, whether uh, it's from someone who works for an air quality uh, company and they've asked whether you have any um, ex have had any experience applying these methods to air quality management. Um, and I guess if not, is there any tips for kind of how it could be prepared? Or do you think these kinds of um, diagrams could basically be used in any system and adapted as yeah, such? Yeah, yeah, uh, any any system. I've not worked in air quality, but I've worked in other environmental uh, projects have done things to do with uh, climate change adaptation processes, with deforest reforestation programs, uh, and um, basically, you know, you you think about the situation you're involved in, air quality. <coughs> uh, so I'm looking out the window. My, I live here in Sheffield, um, so I'm looking out my window and I'm thinking air quality. So if, if I was to start doing a rich picture about air quality. I would um, uh, I would start off by drawing a car, for example, uh, and then I'd probably draw sort of a, a cooling tower to represent uh, a power station, uh, and I'd draw a bicycle probably, um, uh, and I'd, I'd draw other things which are all sort of connected in some way with air quality, and then I just link them all together. So so literally, there is no limit to the the type of subject you can bring into uh, a rich picture. Great, thank you. Um, and when systems become large, um, how is that managed? Is there is there anything like software that can be used to kind of help manage these highly complex systems? Uh, I, I, I think what I would try to do, what I've tried to do in this presentation is talk about just getting started on thinking about things. And, in, and invariably, one of the things which systems thinking is often described as is providing a holistic approach to things. And I'm always a bit reluctant to use that word holistic because it sounds like you're talking about the whole thing. Because inevitably, you have to make certain decisions about where to where to draw a, a boundary, where to end your analysis, what to include and what not to include. So um, I would always try to start off by looking at things simply and, and inevitably. The more you think about things, the bigger it will get. If we think about this hay on Y example, clearly, you know, if we start thinking about the river Y, then we start to think about sort of the other the, the chicken farming. We start to think about the whole food production industry in the country. We start to think about the whole, um, you know, sort of uh, sort of water management system that you know sort of operates or doesn't operate in, in the UK, and all kinds of other sort of you know sort of sort of massive things. So I think it's about trying to start off with something sort of uh, small and that you can conceptually get your head around and then to get it as big as it becomes easy for you to think about. Because we're really just talking about trying to make some sense of something at the moment. We're not necessarily trying to find, you know, all of the solutions to all of the problems that, 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 that are valid at any particular time. Right, thank you. And I think this this question slightly links with that. But um, where does the analysis of key decision makers figure in it, figure in these types of diagrams? Um, just for example, I know you you of course mentioned you're not an expert on this, but in the case of the River Y, there are some uh, some people like MPs, local government um, that aren't included on the di diagram. Um, and the attendees put that sometimes the activity of these people seems to outweigh any systems analysis and indeed almost defy logic. Well, I, do, I wouldn't say they sit outside the systems analysis. The reason why they haven't appeared in my diagram is because um, I didn't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, my my sort of the, the, the research I did for this was based around newspaper articles. And the newspaper articles that I read didn't mention MPs. And that's a very good point as to why aren't MPs mentioned, you know. So, again, if I'd been sitting down with, you know, with people you know, who had more knowledge of the subject, 
you know, it, almost certainly some people just said, well, you know, the MP for this area is interested, not interested, blah, blah, blah. You know, is a farmer, a chicken farmer, you know, all these kinds of things might come up. And so by, by the, you know, by engaging other people, um, you know, that uh, that's got the kind of thing, the information you put into a rich picture. You get the, you know, a diagram of the, the MP, you give, draw a little picture of an MP in the rich picture. And then in the influence diagram, they would be there because clearly mm. they do have an importance. So because I didn't have it in my diagram doesn't mean they're not important. It just means that that shows a limitation to my own analysis. And that highlights the importance of seeing this as something you can do with other people. And if you do it on your own, send it to other people. So, mm. I mean, that's a really good point that somebody has made, is that I've not mentioned MPs. Hadn't occurred to me before now. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think you did touch on this, but um, and it kind of, again, links to what you were just talking about. But um, you can see that the attendee can see that the diagrams would be a good good to prompt discussion. Um, and are the diagrams something that can evolve as you begin to take action on a problem? Oh, yeah, I don't see them as being something that you start and end. I think they're something which you work on. So you would, um, so, you know, if I was, you know, so then if I was to do this presentation again, I would go back to my diagrams and I would put in an MP. Um, and, you know, the more, so if you were using this, for example, as a starting point, if you're presented with a problem, you're asked, can you sort of just give me a bit of a background on this particular situation? You might do some diagrams, which, you know, which which represent your initial understanding of a situation at a particular point in time. You then write something about it. You then present something to somebody else and they will ask you those questions. What about these people? What about those people? You know, why haven't you sort of mentioned that? Ah, yeah, okay, I'll go back and I'll update my diagrams. So they, they should be a, a living document rather than something which, um, you know, you finish off and you never do anything more with. But definitely something that which you should see as helping to sort of continuously inform and strengthen your understanding of a situation. Great, thank you. Um, and of course, we just talked about kind of involving others' perspectives to try and kind of mitigate bias in in the perspective of whoever is doing um, the diagram. But is there any other tips that you can recommend to to do to avoid this kind of bias or particular perspectives when diagramming? I, I think the most important thing is to gather information wi widely, to mm -hmm. to talk to other people, involve other people in the process, to uh, as you. You know, like, for example, I mean, my information came from The Guardian, you know, because I was trying to put this together and that was a very good source of information. But if I, I had more time, I would look up uh, River Action's website. Well, I did briefly look at it. I would try to find out a bit more about what the Environment Agency has been doing about this. Um, so it's about research and using this diagramming process to help you to understand where the gaps in your own knowledge uh, are or where they, they, they might be. Because often we don't know what we don't know. So I think, you know, to to really sort of, you know, to critically examine what you're doing, to think as to whether or not what you're doing is is reasonable, it's complete, it's fair, it's accurate, that sort of thing. But uh, collaboration with others is is probably the key, I would say, to this. Great, thank you. Um, and then last question, just to finish us off, um, is how do you think environmental professionals could use some of these tools that you've outlined uh, in their day-to-day -day work to, just, to support actually the development of solutions of some of these environmental challenges? Well, I think if you're presented with a, you know, sort of a, a, an issue you have to think about, just get out a piece of paper, yeah? Just um, find yourself, you know, flip charts great, you've got a bit of space, um, you know, a piece of A3 paper, A4 paper is a bit small, but, you know, get yourself a piece of paper and just draw some things, just draw some diagrams down on. And it's amazing how powerful just, just simply just putting a few scribbles on a piece of paper can be. Because they, the, the problem with text, as I mentioned in the presentation, is text is very precise and linear. You know, words have a very precise meaning. Um, and uh, when as soon as you write something down on a text, write, start, write a piece of a sentence down about something, it constrains uh, what it is you're thinking. Uh, whereas if you put it, if you draw a diagram, if you write just sort of make a few scribbles on a piece of paper, 
showing, you know, a few stick figures, you know, with cross swords and, you know, names of institutions or organizations or whatever they represent. It kind of stimulates your thinking as to, well, what is the connection between all these different people? You know, what is it that I'm really trying to say here? So to try to keep visual and sort of graphical rather than uh, relying on text, I think is a very important thing. Great. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for presenting today. It was um, really interesting to hear about some of these techniques that can be used. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Um, and thank you as well to all of our attendees today for logging in, um, asking questions. And I hope you found that beneficial and informative. Um, if you are an IES member, don't forget to record your attendance uh, you, uh, uh, at this webinar using the IES CPD tool, which you can find by logging into the members area. Um, and this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. Um, if you are watching the recording on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel, like the video and hit the bell to gain notifications of new content. Once again, a massive thank you to you, Brian and everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody.